Okay, thank you everyone for joining us and welcome to the Cancer Research Institute's webinar series Breakthroughs in Cancer Immunotherapy. Today's date is Thursday, June 5th, 2014. The topic for today's webinar is Harnessing the Immune System to Fight Melanoma. Before we begin, I would like to thank Bristol Myers Squibb for their generous sponsorship of today's webinar. Bristol Myers Squibb is a global biopharma company firmly focused on its mission to discover, develop, and deliver innovative medicines that help patients prevail over serious diseases. Their immunotherapy program, which includes the drugs Yervoy and Nivolumab, have had dramatic impact in patients with melanoma and other types of cancer. My name is Brian Brewer, and I'm Director of Marketing and Communications at the Cancer Research Institute. Cancer Research Institute is the world's only nonprofit organization focused exclusively on harnessing the immune system's power to conquer all types of cancer. We fund scientists all around the world whose work has led to significant breakthroughs in treating cancer with immunotherapy. Over the next 45 minutes, you'll have an opportunity to hear firsthand from an immunotherapy expert how cancer treatment today is undergoing a revolution thanks to these breakthroughs. After a 30-minute presentation from our expert speaker, we will open the discussion to questions submitted by you. You can pose your question at any time throughout the presentation by typing in the Q&A box on your screen. Today's webinar is being recorded and will be made available for viewing on the Cancer Research Institute website and on our YouTube channel. Now it's my pleasure to welcome today's speaker. Dr. Nina Bardwa, Director of Immunotherapy and Medical Director of the Vaccine and Cell Therapy Core Facility at the Icon School of Medicine at Mount Sinai in New York City. Her research focuses on combining fundamental research in dendritic cell biology with innovative translational and clinical approaches, particularly in vaccines using dendritic cells, in HIV, autoimmunity, and of course, cancer. Dr. Bardwaj is also a member of the Cancer Research Institute Scientific Advisory Council and a member of our global CVC Clinical Trials Network. It is now my pleasure to welcome Dr. Bardwaj. Dr. Bardwaj, welcome. Thank you very much, Brian, and, and thank you everyone for joining us uh, at the session today. I'd like to provide today a review of um, novel and um, impending approaches to treat cancers with a focus on melanoma. So as I understand it, um, the audience is, is a mixed audience, so I'd like to start with some very basic immunology that I hope will help guide you through the subsequent uh, presentation. So in order to generate immune response against cancer antigens, uh, there are a number of steps that the immune system must uh, undergo. Initially, uh, Tumor, and tumor cells releasing antigens uh, are uh, recognized by white cells called dendritic cells. And these dendritic cells are so-called sentinels of the immune system, as shown here. They're present in all tissues, and they have the capacity to pick up tumor antigens that are shed by tumor cells. Once they do that, they then uh, acquire a process that allows them to mature. And these mature dendritic cells have the capability to then migrate to the draining lymph nodes, where they will encounter naive CD4 and CD8 positive T cells. We can think of dendritic cells as bearing antigen to the T cells, and the T cells then being the uh, army that will subsequently return to the tumor bed, as shown here, to eliminate the tumor cell. Now, the mature dendritic cell uh, in the uh, draining lymph nodes, uh, will process the tumor antigens into short peptides that are presented on molecules called HLA molecules. The combination of the peptide and the HLA molecule is then recognized by both the CD8 and the CD4 T cells. This uh, recognition takes place by a specific receptor that's present on both cells. Once the T cells are engaged, they will then undergo massive proliferation, as shown here. And if you were in a draining lymph node yourself, you would see dendritic cells interacting with T cells like this. To prevent too much proliferation uh, of the T cells by the dendritic cells, 
the um, T cells actually upregulate a number of molecules, which we'll talk about later, called checkpoint blockade molecules. Here shown as DTLA4 PD1. And we'll return to that later. Once the T cells have um, engaged in this manner and begun to proliferate, they will then return to the draining lymph node, uh, to the draining tumor bed, where they then have the capacity to kill the tumor cells. And um, they can do this very efficiently in early stages of cancer. However, much later on, as tumor cells begin to grow and proliferate, they in turn will release a number of molecules that actually uh, will shut down the effectiveness of these T cells. And when that happens, the T cells express these checkpoint molecules like CTLA4 and PD-1 in a sustained fashion. The tumor bed will also upregulate a number of molecules which are also checkpoint molecules like PDL1 and TIM3. In addition, the tumor bed makes a lot of inhibitory products like IL-10 and TGF beta. And altogether, the production of these inhibitory molecules and factors leads to um, uh, immunosuppression in the tumor microenvironment, which compromises immunity. And as a result, the tumor can escape from the immune system. So how can we modulate the immune system in a way that we can actually uh, eliminate cancer cells in the tumor microenvironment? Well, there are a number of ways this can be done, as illustrated on this slide. We can use approaches to activate dendritic cells so they can stimulate T cells or to reverse dendritic cell function. We can use approaches to enhance the way that T cells grow and become activated so they can recognize tumor cells. And we can also help T cells traffic efficiently to the tumor site. And finally, we can use approaches to reverse inhibition in the tumor microenvironment. And what you'll see coming up is that there are many, many approaches that we can use that actually address all th these three areas. And what is going to be very exciting in terms of immunotherapy for the future is that we now have ways to combine these different um, interventions uh, and um, with the hope that they can be very, very efficacious, even in advanced uh, cancers. So what I'm start with is how uh, scientists use um, interventions to activate dendritic cells and reverse dendritic cell dysfunction. So one uh, simple way, actually, is simply to prepare dendritic cells from patients' um, uh, monocytes in the laboratory and add tumor antigens directly to these dendritic cells and then infuse them back into patients. And that's called a dendritic cell-based vaccine. And we've now learned how to do this in many different ways. We can either take precursors of these dendritic cells, such as monocytes, and develop dendritic cells in the lab or directly isolate dendritic cells from a patient's blood. And when we did studies like that some years ago, taking dendritic cells out and reinfusing them back into the patient, as shown here, we were very delighted to see that these dendritic cells, when pulsed with specific antigens, could induce immunity, as shown here and here, in healthy individuals that was very long-lasting and sustainable. It's very important that these dendritic cells be mature because as you recall, I mentioned that mature dendritic cells are the ones that go to the draining lymph node to activate T cell. Because immature dendritic cells, as shown here, cannot induce an immune response efficiently. So these studies, um, yeah. uh, these studies by ourselves and others uh, have actually laid the groundwork for the first cell-based uh, immunotherapy that was approved in the United States. And this is a product called Cipulusal T, which is actually uh, a dendrit dendritic cell-enriched fraction that carries a tumor antigen that is present in prostate tissue. And this vaccine was designed to treat patients with prostate cancer and resulted in a 22% reduction in the risk of death and a small but significant uh, overall survival. 
And although this vaccine is very modest in terms of what it can do, um, it is now being combined with a number of different agents, as shown here, in order to improve its efficacy. And this vaccine, again, as I, I should mention, it's not a home run, but it does tell you that there is potential for using cell-based approaches to improve immunity uh, in patients. So there have been an, several dendritic cell-based melanoma vaccines that have been tested, including by our group, that will clearly induce immunity in an individual. And uh, where I think the worth of this vaccine will be is really in patients who have very early cancers or who've had their cancers removed surgically, where the immune system can actually bounce back and respond efficient, efficiently to an immune therapy of this type. But you should be aware that there are actually ongoing phase three studies now in a number of cancers, as shown here, brain, renal, and ovarian cancer, that are now testing this type of dendritic cell vaccine, which has been pulsed with antigens derived from these three cancers um, in patients with advanced disease. So we look forward to hearing those results in the near future. So another way to target dendritic cells to promote immunity in the body is instead of taking them out of the body, is trying to target them directly in the body. And the beauty about dendritic cells is that they carry or express a number of receptors which can actually be targeted with an antibody, shown here, to which a tumor antigen has been linked. And one can deliver this complex into patients along with um, adjuvants and stimulate immunity directly uh, in vivo. And um, we're excited to learn that this does work in animal models. And most recently in a study that was published in Science Translational Medicine, where this kind of antibody antigen construct uh, linked to a tumor antigen called NYESA1 was given to patients with multiple solid tumors, including melanoma and uh, did result in the induction of uh, a number of significant immune responses and also gave a clinical signal. And our own group is actually going to uh, expand upon that study. We're going to use the same approach to immunize patients who've had uh, melanoma but who are now melanoma-free. And in those individuals, we are going to use the same antigen antibody complex, but we're also going to use a very interesting growth factor called FLT3 ligand, which when given to uh, individuals can expand the number of dendritic cells in tissue sites and in the blood. So the hope is that the combination of this vaccine and the presence of uh, thousands and to millions more dendritic cells will be even more effective in our patients. So the third way to uh, vaccinate individuals is using non-dendritic self-targeted vaccines. In other words, using vaccines that will eventually get to dendritic cells but don't necessarily specifically target dendritic cells. However, the good news is that dendritic cells express a number of receptors uh, that will recognize uh, these particular vaccines. So by vaccines here, I'm referring to adjuvants. Adjuvants are uh, molecules that can have the effect of directly maturing a dendritic cell, and then the combination of antigen and adjuvant, where the adjuvant is actually combined with uh, proteins or peptides that are derived from the tumor cell themselves. So today there are clinical trials that are actually testing these adjuvants alone, as well as in combination with peptides and proteins. So what are these adjuvants um, that are being used? They're usually molecules that mimic pathogens like viruses and bacteria. And um, these include uh, DNA molecules and RNA molecules. And uh, as I mentioned before, dendritic cells are um, really terrific cells because they express a number of the receptors that will recognize these um, pathogen mimics. And one approach that uh, scientists and clinicians are using now is to take these adjuvants, these viral mimics, and inject them directly into tumors. 
as a way of mobilizing dendritic cells that are present within the tumor site, and then uh, essentially auto-vaccinating the patient to uh, tumor antigens that are within that particular site. And although it sounds somewhat uh, crude, this, this um, type of intervention actually does work. So here's an example of a patient who had a B-cell lymphoma and had this uh, molecule called CPG injected into tumor sites and um, cleared the tumor. And there are many examples of this, uh, and we are also studying a whole panel of viral mimics uh, to try to determine how efficient they are in, in, in helping to not only mobilize the immune system locally within the tumor site, but then hopefully extending the immune response that takes place as a result more systemically to other tumor sites. And this approach in and of itself leads to tumor death, inflammation, dendritic cells coming into tumor site, and then presentation of those tumor antigens to T cells in the draining lymph node. So uh, as a follow-up to that, not only are we using molecules that can mimic these pathogens, but we're also using viruses and bacteria that can be injected directly into tumors. And um, I wanted to describe a recent study where a virus called herpes simplex virus secreting a growth factor that recruits dendritic cells was injected directly into lesions of patients who had melanoma um, that was accessible and in the skin site. And these patients received this virus, or in a control arm, patients received just the growth factor that was being made by the virus. And this is a study that was described and presented recently by Dr. Kaufman at ASCO. And what they found was um, a, actually a remarkable overall response rate of 26 versus 5%. Um, with the responses lasting well over six months. And you, if you can see this blue graph down here, this is data he presented at the meeting, um, you can see um, that the treated arm versus the control did better than the control arm. And the response rate was actually, over time, um, very good compared to old chemotherapeutic uh, interventions for melanoma. And so this approach, um, Although it didn't meet the endpoint of an improvement in overall survival, the good news is it is now being combined with um, a checkpoint um, inhibitor that I'll talk about later in trials and where I suspect the combination is going to look even better. And um, what's very exciting now is that a number of viruses, as shown in the bottom here, are now being tested in various cancers, including melanoma to see how effective they might be in these um, more superficial lesions. And along those lines, um, I wanted to point out that there are phase three studies that are testing various kinds of uh, viral vectors expressing tumor antigens instead of just a growth factor. In this particular case, it's in prostate cancer. So where the phase two study actually showed a nice uh, uh, a response in the experimental arm. And so we'll look forward to seeing the results of that study as well. So now I'll talk about um, how we can actually combine some of these adjuvants that I've talked about with peptides and proteins um, to elicit a specific, a tumor-specific response. And this table just lists uh, many of the antigens that have been used um, in cancer vaccines, and especially in melanoma. So um, these types of vaccines use uh, antigens that are expressed in melanocytes, like melanin, and GP100. They can use mutated antigens, uh, viral antigens in case of viral-associated uh, uh, tumors, like um, in cervical cancer or head and neck cancer, and also shared self-antigens. And again, melanoma has been the benchmark for this, uh, for testing what we call um, shared tumor antigens or cancer testis antigens, such as MAGE A3 and NYESA1. And these antigens 
are not usually expressed in normal tissues, but are only expressed in tumor tissues for the most part. So there are two studies that have used this approach, um, one in non-small cell lung cancer and one actually that um, was uh, completed last year uh, in the adjuvant setting of melanoma, meaning uh, this vaccine was tested in patients who had their tumors resected and were tumor free. And the idea here was that the vaccine could hopefully um, induce a very effective immune response that would delay or prevent the melanoma from recurring. The vaccine was made of the MAGE A3 cancer testis antigen with uh, a number of adjuvants um, that, again, are um, mimics of viruses or bacteria. So unfortunately, in the phase three trial, the study didn't meet the endpoint of extending disease-free survival. However, what was learned or learned along the way is that um, patients' tumors uh, uh, express signatures, um, what we refer to as immune signatures, that seem to indicate that patients on their own can actually activate the immune system within the tumor. And these patients who receive the vaccine and are being studied to see whether patients who happen to have a gene signature that indicated their immune system was already activated may do better as, uh, in response to this vaccine than those patients who did not. And this uh, uh, table here really just outlines for you the sorts of signatures of proteins that we like to see upregulated in a tumor, such as interferons and chemokines and those sorts of proteins that can uh, activate um, the immune system locally. And the goal really of the intratumoral approaches I mentioned to you earlier is to try to change tumors that don't have these so-called good immune signatures into good immune signatures so um, that patients can jumpstart their immune, own immune system subsequently to um, attack their tumor cells. So the other approach um, that um, we've used in the clinic is, is, as I told you in this previous study, um, the protein MAGE A3 that was used as part of this vaccine is the entire protein. But if you remember from earlier on when I spoke to you about how dendritic cells process tumor antigens to present them to T cells, they have to chop them up into small peptides. And uh, that is what is recognized by a T cell. In this study, in this clinical study that um, came out of Dr. Case Malif's lab, um, they tested a novel vaccine where instead of using a whole protein as part of their vaccine, they actually used long peptides of around 30 amino acids long along with uh, an adjuvant and tested it in patients who had uh, vaginal intraepithelial neoplasia. And remarkably, when they used these long peptides as opposed to using a whole protein, they were able to show um, complete resolution of the lesion in many patients and an induction of a very effective immune response to um, the tumor-associated antigen. And um, what was even more exciting and presented recently at the AACR meeting is that this vaccine can be combined with chemotherapy uh, to induce even more effective responses in patients with cervical cancer. We now have a study planned at Mount Sinai this fall where we'll use these types of long peptides in combination with potent um, viral mimics uh, in patients in, with who have had melanoma but who are now disease-free in the hope that this altered long peptide approach can induce effective immunity in our melanoma patients. So how else can we improve vaccines? So I've mentioned to you auto-vaccination by intratumoral injection of uh, pathogen mimics. I've talked to you about using uh, long peptides um, from antigens in conjunction with adjuvants. Uh, but more recently, there's been a renewed interest in trying to identify antigens in tumors that are unique to the patient. 
The table that I shared with you earlier listed a number of antigens that are either shared with, within a class of tumors or are shared amongst many tumors. But what we've now learned um, from sequencing tumors from hundreds and hundreds of patients is that if you look at the frequency of mutation within tumors, the tumor that has the highest number of mutations is, in fact, melanoma. And that is because um, a lot of patients who get melanoma are those who have had a lot of sun exposure and UV radiation can induce mutations. So what this tells us is that melanoma has lots of mutations, and therefore the hypothesis would be that melanoma would have a lot of new or neoantigens, um, which can actually be recognized by the immune system. Because normally when we, uh, as our immune system is being generated um, during embryogenesis and, and after, the uh, immune system becomes tolerized to antigens that are what we call self-antigens, our own proteins. That's to avoid autoimmunity. But if there are a lot of neoantigens or new antigens being created in the tumor, then one could argue that the immune system should really be able to recognize them because they are now new. And so we and other investigators are now actually taking a tumor, and a tumor itself and uh, then uh, uh, un uh, undergoing a process that allows us to sequence the DNA and the RNA to, to identify tumor-specific mutations, and then using algorithms to see how which ones, which of those mutations in the form of peptides would bind efficiently to uh, our own HLA molecules. And then we synthesize these mutated peptides, and we give them back to the patient um, along with a good adjuvant. And so that's exactly what's being done. And recent studies from Dr. Rosenberg's lab has actually provided proof of principle that patients, in fact, uh, with melanoma do have T cells in their tumor tissue that, in fact, recognize the patient's own neoantigens. So here, Dr. Rosenberg's group harvested the T cells from the tumor, and then they were able to um, sequence the, the DNA from the tumor as well, and then tried to match the T cells with these uh, neoantigens and showed they could recognize several T cells um, that saw these neoantigens on, on the HLA molecules. And a recent study has actually shown that uh, those patients who have more neoantigens um, as a result of mutations in their tumors may possibly even do better suggesting that our immune systems have actually um, been engaged to recognize these new antigens. And perhaps by coming back and further immunizing patients um, to boost our immune system beyond what the immune system is already doing, we can make an impact in vaccination. So this is the question many of us are asking now. Are personalized vaccines going to be the approach? And what is the best way to give them? And I would argue that um, we, will, we should consider giving them early in cancer rather than late, and also in combinations with other modalities that would improve the efficacy of the vaccination. And in fact, that is happening. But uh, there are a number of studies now where vaccina vaccines are being given either in neoadjuvant settings or very, very early cancers, like um, very early breast cancer, head and neck cancers before they're even removed, and likewise in pancreatic cancer before it's even removed. And then uh, the other approach, as I mentioned, is actually using uh, vaccines with patient-specific neoepitopes. And a study is now opened in melanoma at the Dana-Farber Cancer Center and one in Germany. And I understand there's now one open in melanoma at Washington University and and at Sinai, we hope to open one uh, later this year. So uh, while the concept of vaccination is very encouraging in advanced cancer, um, I just want to point out that these platforms often don't induce durable or potent term immunity. And that's largely because we have to consider we have very large immunosuppressive tumor burdens 
the vaccines don't get rid of the many of the immune inhibitory mechanisms I described to you earlier. And often in vaccines, we use one or two antigens, which allows the immune system to escape vaccination. And of course, this last uh, point is being addressed with personalized vaccines, but how else can we possibly make vaccines better? And that is through combinations, and that is really going to be our future. While vaccines have can have a little effect in late in advanced cancers, and chemotherapy can have an effect, but tumors can return. It's the combination of this and many other factors um, that I think. Um, we're not only seeing now in the clinic, but that we will see more and more of. And these include checkpoint blockade inhibitors, adoptive cell therapies, and so forth. And I'll be describing some of those to you in the next few slides. So the second area where we can intervene is really to try to improve T cell function and numbers. And um, one of the things that's being done and pioneered by the Rosenberg um, June uh, labs are to increase T cell numbers that recognize tumor antigens by expanding them in the lab and then giving them back into the patient, and that's called adoptive cell therapy. The other approach has been to give factors that can directly improve T cell activation and proliferation. So they include growth factors like IL-2, IL-7, and IL-15. IL-2 is uh, a growth factor for T cells, and that has actually been approved to give um, uh, in renal cancer and in and melanoma. And there is a small percentage of patients that respond to um, uh, IL-2. And um, there are also inhibitors of immune suppression, like IGO inhibitors and cytoxin, but I won't address those um, in this talk. But you should just know there are factors that also inhibit T regulatory cell function. And finally, um, this checkpoint blockade. So for adoptive cell therapies, this really just involves, um, or involved initially, isolating T cells out of the tumor, growing them up, expanding them, and then giving them back to the patient. And there's been um, success with that approach. And, um, and that approach has now gone taken a number of other iterations, and, and that is that um, the labs I mentioned, Drs. June and Rosenberg, have learned to actually take T cells and take the T cell receptor that recognizes the tumor antigen and actually clone it out and put it back into T cells, patients' normal T cells, and then reinfuse those T cells back into the individual. And the third approach has been the development of a very sophisticated receptor that is called CAR, a chimeric antigen receptor. That's essentially a modified antibody that recognizes a tumor antigen, which is linked to um, the signaling molecules that are seen in a T cell receptor. And that approach has been very effective in uh, certain B cell uh, leukemias. Um, that you may have also heard about. And so we have a number of different approaches for adoptive cell therapy that can be quite effective. And so here's an example from a study from by Robbins and Rosenberg, in patients who received engineered T cells that recognized um, the tumor antigen, NYE so one, by virtue of the fact that the T cells were um, given these cloned receptors that recognized NYE so one. And the patients had sarcoma um, or melanoma. And uh, as you can see in this case here, uh, some very dramatic regressions of, of the tumor after these T cells were reinfused back into the patient. And um, uh, I won't discuss the CAR approach, um, uh, but I think many of you probably likely heard about it in the news or read about it in the journals. But that is also expanding to be used in uh, many solid tumors as well, uh, including in melanoma. So another way to improve T cell function involves the use of checkpoint blockade. And um, 
a recent ASCO meeting, there was a lot of um, uh, progress in this area, which I will describe to you. But very briefly, um, as I mentioned earlier, when a dendritic cell activates a T cell, it um, uh, becomes um, not only activated, but it becomes uh, able to produce growth factors that can lead to the killing of tumor cells. In order to prevent overproliferation, these T cells will express molecules, inhibitory molecules such as CTLA4 and PD1, to prevent overstimulation of the T cell. Unfortunately, in the immunosuppressive tumor microenvironment, when T cells are um, engaged and, and overproliferating, over time they become exhausted and they will continually express CTLA4 and PD1, whereas under normal circumstances these would be downregulated. In addition, the tumor microenvironment will express ligands of PD1, um, such as PDL1. And so, um, led by uh, Jim Allison and others, um, the first approach to try to reverse this exhaustion of T cells that express CTLA4 or PD1 was to create antibodies against these two molecules, as well as the ligand PDL1, that could essentially uh, reverse the inhibition conferred by these molecules on T cells and restore their natural anti-tumor activity. And so we now have a, as an approved therapy for melanoma, the antibody to, against CTLA-4, um, also um, called Yervoy, and that has had um, marked uh, improvement in, in responses and overall survival in patients. So it's a frontline therapy for melanoma. Uh, and more excitingly now, we're hearing about results in trials with antibodies to PD-1 and PDL one So this is a summary of a study uh, led by Suzanne Topalian looking at survival and remission and safety in patients with advanced melanoma receiving nivolumab, which is an anti-PD-1 antibody. And as you can see, um, this is a follow-up study to an earlier one that was published in the New England Journal of Medicine. You can see that at two years and three years, we have pretty dramatic overall survival rates and also uh, progression-free survival, uh, as shown here. So that's a very exciting follow-up of the first study. Uh, another antibody, um, this one now from um, produced by Merck, um, and called Pembrolizumab. Um, was recent, its follow-up uh, trial results were presented at ASCO this year by a number of investigators, Drs. Rebus, Hamid, and Keffert. So it's a, a complicated trial design because they basically tested a number of different concentrations of the antibody in patients with advanced melanoma. And they also looked at patients who had not received prior frontline therapy, namely ipilimumab or the anti-CTLA-4 antibody. So they were able to, uh, first of all, look at patients who received an this antibody without prior receiving uh, ipilimumab. And then they also looked at patients who had failed ipilimumab, like in this group here, who then subsequently went on to get anti-PD-1 uh, antibody. And this, um, sorry, this is the, um, this is the, um, overall survival so far of, of all the groups. And um, if you remember in the old days, the overall survival down for uh, stage four melanomas was down here somewhere, and you can see where we are now. It's very, very exciting. And now this is the, um, a study that was presented or published a few years ago, looking now at an anti-PD-L1 antibody. That's a ligand for PD-1. And again, this study was very exciting because it showed um, a good objective responses in a number of uh, cancers, not just melanoma, but renal cell, non-small cell, as well as ovarian. And um, at ASCO this year again, there was a follow-up this time for an anti-PD-L1 from um, 
uh, another company, but also showing very exciting data in patients with advanced solid tumors. A very safe antibody with no serious adverse events and evidence of clinical activity. And now an expansion study uh, is occurring into multiple solid tumors, lung, head and neck, melanoma, breast, and so forth, with responses apparently evident in multiple cancers. Um, again, this is not a mature study. Um, it's still evolving, but um, I think the exciting point here is that these antibodies are going to be able to be used not only in melanoma, but in multiple cancers um, with clinical activity. So the next decade is going to be very exciting. And then I think one of the most exciting presentations by Dr. Rebus was a follow-up study um, looking at the combination of antibodies that target both uh, CTLA-4 and also um, with ipilimumab and also um, the target PD-1 with nivolumab. Um, so hope you can keep the names right. <laughs> but anyway, so it's a combination study that is uh, looking at the effects of, of combining inhibition of both PD-1 and anti-CTLA-4. And these are pooled data. And in the red is um, showing you the um, survival rate of the arm that received these particular doses of the two antibodies. And here we are, here's our overall survival. One year was 94%, two years was 88%. And then there was there were several cohorts in the group, and the rest have been combined here. But um, even so, this is a remarkable, truly remarkable. Um, response rate and survival rate, um, which is, I think, just fantastic. And um, finally, I just want to tell you about a study that was again presented at ASCO where um, ipilimumab, that's the anti-CTLA-4 antibody, was actually tested in the adjuvant setting of melanoma. I, in other words, patients with stage 3 melanoma have their tumors resected. The idea here being that can we give these checkpoint inhibitors earlier uh, with the hope of reducing um, um, progression and improving survival. So this study, um, the, this is the first report of the study. It's just looking at recurrence-free survival at this point. We don't have data on overall survival yet, but there was a significant difference in the arm that received anti-CTLA-4 versus the um, arm that received placebo. So uh, again, encouraging results. We'll have to see what overall survival shows um, as the study matures. And there is another study that's actually looking at different doses of ipilimumab um, and interferon in the adjuvant setting. So I'll just leave you here uh, in this section by pointing out that We've discussed CTLA-4 and PD-1 and its ligand in terms of checkpoints, but there are many more. And so we are in the um, era where a number of these antibodies have been uh, developed and are actually in the clinic currently, which, um, which perhaps either alone or in combination with these two main checkpoint inhibitors may, may even uh, improve efficacy further. So a lot of amazing things to come. So um, all this uh, data that I presented to you has really renewed the enthusiasm for cancer vaccines. Remember I mentioned that cancer vaccines are going to be most effective when they're used in combination. And I won't go through all these, but there are studies now in melan um, that will happen in melanoma, for example, um, which will combine vaccination with um, some of these checkpoint uh, inhibitors. So those are going to be very, very exciting to hear about as well. So the final area I wanted to talk about was really uh, reversing inhibition in the tumor microenvironment. I'm going to keep this short because um, there's a lot going on here, and I just wanted to give you a bird's eye view here. So one approach to reverse uh, immune suppression in the tumor microenvironment has really been to try to use chemotherapy and radiation therapy to kill off tumor cells 
to release factors that can actually mature dendritic cells in the tumor microenvironment. And that is turning out to be an effective way to stimulate dendritic cells uh, in the body. And these approaches are now also being combined with checkpoint inhibitors. Other approaches are actually looking at how to neutralize inhibitory factors like IL-10 and TGF-beta in the tumor microenvironment, uh, and also um, to use factors, to use inhibitors of, of products made locally, such as um, uh, IDO, which induces T regulatory cells, and many of the molecules that I've listed here. And um, of course, anti VEGF, which is already in the clinic, which may also be efficacious um, even in melanoma. Then there are monoclonal antibodies that um, can actually target our receptors directly on tumor cells. Um, you've probably heard about antibodies to HER2 new in breast cancer, but there are antibodies to CD20 um, to treat uh, B cell tumors. And we're now learning how to target these antibodies with um, drugs, uh, toxins that will kill off the tumor, or that can bring growth factors into the tumor site, or that can bring T cells directly into the tumor site. And then I mentioned antibodies to various cytokines. So um, I hope I've given you some sense of interventions that um, those of us who do immunotherapy are using to activate DCs, enhance T cells, reverse inhibition in the tumor microenvironment, and all the wonderful new um, interventions that are really uh, bringing us into a new era of treat for treating cancers. And these are the ongoing phase three trials of therapeutic cancer vaccines. So we're going to have a lot of wonderful new information in the near future. So. I'll stop there, and thank you very much for your attention, and uh, happy to answer any questions. All right. Thank you so much for that, Dr. Bardwaj. Very interesting presentation. Uh, you, you showed us that there's a, a breadth of exploration going on with various approaches to mobilizing the immune system to fight not just melanoma, uh, but other tumor types as well. So we have just a little bit of time to take some questions from the people who are watching today's webinar. Uh, the first one is, you, you mentioned auto-vaccination when you were talking about CPG and viral vectors and things like that. Can you just explain briefly what, what do you mean by auto-vaccination? So um, talking about auto-vaccination is trying to take advantage of uh, body's own immune system to recognize antigens in the tumor. Uh, currently, as used tumor vaccines, take a tumor antigen, mix it with an adjuvant, and then give it to a patient. But what we've realized is the tumor actually is the source of all these neoantigens. And if we can somehow engage and put together those neoantigens with dendritic cells in the tumor, we might be able to create our own vaccines within the tumor bed itself. And so the concept of water vaccination is to give a viral or bacterial mimic or even a viral vector directly into the tumor bed and activate it, sort of blow it up so that um, we can kill the tumor directly, the tumor antigens that are released can be picked up by the dendritic cells in the tumor bed, and then those dendritic cells can, can carry and ferry those antigens to the draining lymph node. So that's the idea behind auto vaccination. All right, thank you for that. Um, <clears throat> one question is uh, why is CTLA4 slash PD1 blockade only effective in a handful of patients, uh, roughly about 20%, and how can we increase their efficacy? So that's a good question. Um, what we're learning is that patients who do respond to anti-CTLA-4 can turn on their T cells. And we think the T cells that are turned on are the ones that have already been educated to recognize tumor antigen. And so the patients that are responding may be the ones that um, who have already sort of educated their T cells to the tumor. In addition, we don't know 
that the T cells that express CTLA4 are necessarily tumor specific. So it could be that we're we're releasing the brakes on not only tumor uh, specific T cells but other T cells. And, and in fact, we know that's the case because the side effects of anti CTLA therapy are autoimmunity. Um, so patients who get this treatment are at higher risk of getting some autoimmune side effects. Um, and um, but what we are learning from these studies is that this uh, antibody may actually be even more effective alone than anti-CTLA-4. But I think the even more compelling question is when we use the combination, we can um, get an even, we think, we hope an even better clinical result. And I should also point out that CTLA-4 uh, blockade may work at a different um, stage of T cell activity, whereas CTLA-4 and T cells comes up very quickly and it works more at the factor stage. Uh, PD-1 on the T cell may be uh, when the T cell is already in the tumor microenvironment and you want to block its interaction with PD-L1 expressing tumor cells. Okay, thanks for that. Um, will we see dramatic uh, survival rates like we saw in that uh, last uh, combo study in melanoma where 88% uh, of patients two years out were still uh, surviving. Will we see those in other tumor types, do you think, and, and how soon? Uh, I think we will. I think we have hints that um, patients with lung cancer, renal cancer, um, will, will uh, respond very effectively to those, that combination type therapy. And certainly the single agent studies are in progress many solid tumors, and I'm sure we're going to see those combinations in the near future. So um, there's a lot of hope. Okay, great. Uh, we have a question from a patient now saying, um, I just had a resection of my right underarm tumor and lymph nodes. I'm considered stage 3C. Any suggestions for preventative therapy to prevent recurrence? That's a great question, and um, as a um, patient may know, the approved therapies are interferon at the moment, um, but there are studies underway now to think about um, uh, that where trials are testing ipilimumab in the adjuvant setting, and, um, uh, and also vaccine trials. So some of the trials that I mentioned during my presentation, so we are doing with vaccination are actually do involve uh, resected melanoma. So those trials will be opening shortly and there are a number of others around the country. So, so for patients who are, are trying to do something in that window, so to speak, there are studies that, that are open or will be open uh, that you might consider. Okay, that's great. And um, in just a moment, I will let uh, everyone watching know how they can find information on clinical trials uh, of cancer immunotherapies for various types of tumors. So our last question uh, before we sign off with you, Dr. Bardwaj, um, you, you said that you recently attended the uh, meeting of the uh, American Society of Clinical Oncology, or ASCO, uh, which is, I think, the world's largest onco clinical oncology meeting. Uh, in Chicago. And um, at that meeting, there was a great deal of attention paid to immunotherapy for cancer. Um, the, the presentations, the scientific data that we saw generated a lot of excitement uh, both last year and this year. So my question to you is, um, I know that you were a panelist on a session called Immunology for Non-Immunologists. And I'm wondering, yeah. Uh, how was that panel received, and how does that compare to how such a panel may have been received just a few years ago? Uh, it was really well received. We, um, my uh, colleagues and I who spoke at that session entered a very large room, and I must say we were worried that it, we would, the attendance would be very low, but we probably had about 1,500 uh, people in the audience. And I can tell you, um, if we were to have given the same session um, 
uh, five year, four or five years ago, we probably were only a handful of people. So it was remarkable, and um, we were astonished to see how much interest there was. And of course, very grateful that people are um, catching on to the message and the um, uh, of uh, the immunotherapy is not only here to stay, but it's going to be remarkably effective. Well, I think this is a uh, this is a message that's sinking in now, not only for oncologists, uh, but also it's beginning to uh, penetrate the public consciousness. Uh, Dr. Nancy Snyderman from the, from the Today Show recently said that. Uh, immunotherapy is obviously the future of cancer treatment and so that's uh, that's a way that we have always felt at the Cancer Research Institute and I know that that kind of sentiment must be very exciting for researchers like you who are on the front lines of this uh, new approach to cancer treatment. So uh, that's all the time we have for questions today. Uh, before we conclude, I just have a few notes for you. Um, again, I would like to thank today's sponsor, Bristol Myers Squibb, for making today's webinar possible. Um, I'd like to also call your attention to our upcoming webinars. Registration is open at cancerresearch.org slash webinars. Uh, we will be covering prostate, bladder, and kidney cancers, ovarian cancer, and other tumors, and then, of course, lung cancer, which, as we know, is the number one cancer killer uh, in the United States. Also, in case you didn't know, June is Cancer Immunotherapy Month. It's our second annual month. This is a, an awareness initiative organized by the Cancer Research Institute to increase public awareness of immunotherapy's potential to revolutionize all cancer treatment. Uh, tomorrow is uh, White Out Cancer Day. This is a social uh, media movement where we encourage all of you to wear white and upload photos of yourselves wearing white to social media using the hashtag WhiteOutCancer. Uh, if you don't know what a hashtag is, you can go to our website cancerresearch.org forward slash join the movement to learn more about how you can participate in this social media event. Also now, if you are interested in learning about clinical trials uh, and are a patient or if you are a caregiver of a patient interested in a cancer immunotherapy clinical trial, you can visit the Cancer Research Institute's website at cancerresearch.org forward slash clinical trial finder and there you can browse a directory of clinic, uh, cancer immunotherapy clinical trials. You can also call a phone number to speak with a clinical trials navigator who can help connect you with a trial for which you may be eligible. And with that I'd like to thank you all for participating today. I will remind you that today's presentation is being videotaped and will be made available on the Cancer Research Institute website uh, I think at the beginning of, of next week, so check back then if you're interested in sharing this webinar with others. Thank you again, Dr. Bardwaj, for participating and for sharing that wonderful information, and we look forward to connecting with all of you again next week. Thank you. Thank you.